This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Right, that's three days, it's crazy. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I spent two years in witness protection driving myself quite simply mentally ill over that, thinking about it, right? I did. And drinking too much and all of that. You know, sometimes I've had, I'd have a surveillance team watching me, you know, and, and trust me, surveillance ain't how they show it in the movies, you know. I said, well, if this guy is flamboyant and he's gay, um, I'm going to dress up as though I'm a flamboyant gay man. Did you bear? And I'll knock on his door. And then I said, you know, I hear you, uh, you, you've you got some really good LSD. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he went to his cupboard pulled out sheet upon sheet of them and said, how many do you want? I said, all of them, because you're nicked. Conversely, there were other occasions, one most notably when I was being held hostage and the, the guy was threatening me that the only way I would have got out of this shop that I was locked into, which was a, a knife shop, believe it or not, was with, as he pointed to the wall, he said, the only way you're getting out of here if you don't bring the money in here is with six of those in your back. And on the wall is like swords, swords and machetes and ugly looking daggers and all that and I'd been negotiating for hours and clearly clearly he meant what he said so you know by about 11 o'clock in the morning I've already been three different people and this went on day in day out I was having a time of my life you know I was bringing down career criminals Then we're on. Today's guest, we've got former police detective Peter Blakesley. How are you, Peter? Very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good. First of good. all, thanks for coming on the show. You've been very high profile at catching fugitives and used to work for the police. You're also an author now. You've wrote the book, Manhunt. Yep. Um, you're trying to fit. So this book is for Kevin Par Parrow, is it? Paul, Paul, Kevin Paul. Yeah. So, yeah. This is hunting Britain's most wanted murderer, double murderer. Um, well, he's not been tried and convicted of those crimes, mm -hmm. right? So at the moment, he's wanted for them. And part of my whole reasons for trying to find him is that he needs to stand in a court and answer the allegations that are made against him. So he's not convicted yet, but been on the run for 16 years, needs to be found. A long time. A very long time. A very long time. And, and in that regard, um, I have to begrudgingly give him some credit. Um, I started hunting him 18 months ago. It's been a remarkable journey, to be quite frank with you. I, I guess I was a bit naive. I didn't really know where the journey was going to take me, which you would think an old sweat like me, former detective, you know, would, would, would anticipate some of the pitfalls. But it's been remarkable 
Um, may I start at the beginning of the hunt for Kevin Powell? Yeah, well, I always go back to the start. We'll touch on that. I always go back to the start with my guests, okay. find out a bit about yourself, where you grew up and how it began. Okay, well, I was uh, born in a place called Bexley Heath, which is, that? it's an outermost London borough. So I always say it's one of those kind of schizophrenic places. <laughs> it's got, it's a London borough, but it's got a Kent postcode. You know, so it's, it's, I can't say, you know, I came from the tough side of the street. You know what I mean? I didn't. It was kind of like leafy and it was pleasant and still is, you know, and I still live in Bexley. Um, but born there into a, a, an unhappy marriage. <clears throat> My dad was drinking way beyond control and was abusive and all that sort of stuff. So he left when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And quite frankly, it was, you know, good riddance to bad rubbish at the time. Um, but that left my mum in a house she couldn't afford with me and my elder sister. So the house got sold. My sister, who was older than me, went off to nursing when she was 16. So at the age of about 12, it's me and my mum in a flat now, uh, the pair of us. And mum's going out to work every day to put food on the table and clothes on my back, bless her. And I've still got her. She's 92 and, like, remarkable. So I'm Fair old very, age. very, very lucky to have her. And, um, yeah, um, with no male role models to speak of, you can probably guess the rest. You know, I went a bit off the rails. Um, <clears throat> didn't go to school anywhere near as often as I should have done. Um, got involved in petty crime, the shoplifting, the criminal damage, the graffiti, you know, that kind of nonsense. None of which I'm remotely proud of um left school at 16 got a job as a warehouse warehouse man um in Woolworths beloved Woolworths long gone and um yeah I was sort of jogging along with that until I came home one night and to my horror there was an enormous uniformed police officer sitting in the lounge of the flat and my first thought was like what am I going to get nicked for but it turns out my mum very wisely, cleverly, had got the local community cop to come round our flat and have a chat with me, kind of, you know, saying, well, what are you doing with your life and why don't you consider joining the old bill? And literally, as he got up to, to sort of leave, he pulled out the application form for the police cadets because I was only 16 at the time. And uh, he stood over me while I filled it out there and then. And a few short weeks later, that was it. Got my hair cut. Went to Hendon and I was a police cadet, you know, shining my boots and ironing my shirts and running around the parade square. That's how it started. And, and that was it. But, but when I got there, you see, I, I, I got the, I kind of had respect for the, for the people that were the instructors. You know, like the, the PT, the physical training instructors, most of them were former Royal Marines, right, who had gone into the old bill and then were, were PT instructors. And so unlike the teachers that I disrespected, you know, shamefully at school, um, when these blokes said, Oi, Blexley, down to 10 press-ups, you know, because you'd done something wrong, you know, you'd lent on a wall or, you know, your, your plimps holes weren't sparkly white, you know, down to 10 press-ups, or what, wasn't an option. Because if you'd said, or what, they'd have turned you into a crowd in a blink of an eye, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and so, so I just thrived on that kind of discipline got incredibly fit, um, did that in the cadets. Was there a certain weight? Was there a certain height, weight? Yeah, there then, was. Back then? There was, but when I was interviewed, I wasn't tall enough. But they'd obviously took a look at me, you know, and I'm 16 and they're thinking, mm -hmm. well, this kid's going to grow in the next couple of years. Um, so I got in um, and I did grow and, and, you know, ended up being, you know, six foot and a bit like I am today. Yeah. So, so that was all fine and... I got incredibly fit and, you know, joined the boxing team, race walk and all that sort of stuff. Couldn't get enough sport. Um, and when I was 18 and a half, went up to the other end of the estate in Peckham. You know, they, the police had an enormous great estate then with driving schools and detective schools and all that stuff. Did my training and got posted to Peckham in South East London, which was a lot tougher than leafy Bexley Heath where I'd grown up. So this little, you know, yeah, suddenly I was up against some properly, properly kind of, you know, hard nose. What was that like, your first criminals. night on the beat? Yeah, well, in those days, you couldn't go out on the beat until you were 19 years old. Mm -hmm. 
And so I got to Peckham and I had about a month before my 19th birthday. And so they had to keep you in the station. So you'd work in the control room, or we called it the reserve room in those days, with the very unsophisticated radio things. Well, I drove everybody mad because I just wanted to get out there on the streets. I was chomping at the bit. I'd been on the streets as a police cadet, right, when I was 17. So to me, it was all nonsense that I couldn't go out on the streets as a police constable until I was 19. And I drove the sergeants and the inspector absolutely round the twist. You know, any opportunity to leap over the front counter of the station, you know, and run up the high street and get involved in something, you know. And they're going, you shouldn't be doing this. Eventually, they caved in and before my 19th birthday, just to shut me up, you know, they let me go out on the streets of Peckham. And, and there was a lot of crime. I didn't have to look too hard to find people that were up to no good. But it was very different, you know, very different. And it had a large Afro-Caribbean population there as well. You know, and these are pretty dark days, you know. Some of the policing that went on was shameful. Um, and uh, and is a, a matter that I speak about honestly and sometimes upset a lot of ex-old Bill about it because I talk about the racism that there was in the police and I talk about the fact that if you were young and you were black and you were on the streets of Peckham or Brixton for example and your face didn't fit you didn't stand a chance because you'd get fitted up and you'd probably get beaten up as well yeah do you think the, race, the racism's still here it's, if not it's, it's getting worse because I know you did that you'd stuck up for someone and everybody from the police kind of turned against you took your Facebook groups and shit like that oh yeah they went they went Garrity. What they happened? Did. I did an article in the newspaper and I gave an honest appraisal of what I saw and what I experienced in the late 1970s and the, and the early 1980s. That fact that if your face didn't fit, you know. Because policing wasn't by consent for the black population of Peckham. It was imposed upon them. And they were seen as like a threat, you know, and... and People like me and, and the other, some of the, if not many of the other cops that I worked with, you know, we came from that sort of, you know, lower middle class sort of background, you know what I mean? Or that, you know, where, where everything was white, you know, every face you ever saw was white. All right, there was some, some Asian boys in my school, but, you know, certainly nobody from the Caribbean, from a Caribbean background. And we got to Peckham. And you could tell that some cops were just clearly quite terrified because of the colour of people's skin. And and they were deeply prejudiced against them, you know. And I shamefully fell into that trap, you know. But, of course, I had my redemption moment a few years later when I realised, you know, what utter nonsense it is to judge somebody on the faith that they follow or the colour of their skin, or what they wear, or the colour of their hair, and all that kind of nonsense, you know, just what complete and utter bollocks that was. Mm. So, a couple of months ago, gave an interview to a newspaper, telling the truth as I had seen it, and as I had experienced it, and they went friggin' mental. Kicked me out of every police Facebook group that I was a member of, there's an organisation called the Metropolitan Police Ex-Detectives Association and the chair of that association actually had the balls to ring me up and tell me that I was being kicked out because I'd brought the association into disrepute. For what? For telling the truth. For saying that there was a bunch of vile, racist thugs in the old bill in the 70s and the 80s and here we are, 40 years later, and you take exception to me telling the truth. Good. I'm glad to be rid of it. I wouldn't want to be a part of any group like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, that's fine. Was there a lot of racism then? Did you see a lot of it? It was, it was abominable. You know, it was... You know, there, there was one office in the Nick, you know, and they'd, they'd, there'd been a punch-up with a, a Rastafarian guy, you know, when he'd been nicked, and dreadlocks that had been pulled off him during during the punch-up were pinned to the notice board like a trophy. You know, and, and I have no qualms about telling the truth because you learn from your mistakes. 
And I've made so many mistakes in my life and will continue to do so. But you know what? In the morning, when I have a shave and look myself in the mirror, I'm not afraid to call myself a twat if I've been a twat. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the only way that, that you learn, isn't it? Accept your mistakes, learn from them, grow, move on. Did people ever get fitted up or anything? Uh, dreadfully, dreadfully. You know, in those days, there was the sus laws, right? Which is short for being a suspected person which was a part of the Vagrancy Act of 1824, I think it was. And now the Sus Laws caused an awful lot of aggravation and animosity between young black men and the police because they get fitted up. I'll give you a, a, a description and I'll try and keep it as brief as I can as to, to what Sus was. Right. So for a person to be arrested and charged with under the Sus Laws... They had to be seen to commit two overt acts. That's kind of like the legal sort of, you know, requirement. So I'll break that down into the practicalities, okay? There's a young black man at a bus stop who may or may not have a previous conviction, right? Who's waiting for a bus and who a particular police officer might take a disliking to, right? Because of his colour, because he might have a conviction or not, or whatever it is. The evidence would read something like this. Said young black man, as a bus approached the bus stop and people converged towards the bus, that young black man was seen to approach a lady who had a handbag draped over her shoulder and his hand went towards her handbag. Yeah, went in towards her handbag. Yeah. And then perhaps the evidence might say, so the lady tugged on her handbag, he quickly withdrew his hand and there was nothing in it, right? So the inference obviously being that he's trying to dip in at the handbag and steal something, a purse invariably, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one overt act, right? Now let's remember, late 70s, early 80s, no CCTV, nobody with a phone, with a camera, right? So there is nothing to refute the evidence to contradict the evidence of the cop, right? So that bus goes, that lady might get on it, according to the evidence, right, inverted commas. So then another bus comes along, similar scenario, young black man, seen to put his hand towards a handbag, all of that kind of stuff. And then, boom, he gets nicked. The arresting officer takes him back to the police station, tells the station sergeant that's the evidence, two overt acts... Yeah, and he's charged with sus. Now, there were there were variations on it. So there's sus handbags. There was sus car door handles, right? So same scenario, but the evidence says that that young black man walking down the street was seen to try two or three car door handles, with the inference being he's hoping to come across an unlocked car so he can steal something from it or try and steal the car. Now, you try refuting that evidence. You you get charged and go to court and you're a young black kid and you're give, and, and the evidence against you is being given by two police officers yeah, who, who, who invariably would be believed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are. You are completely and utterly. And there was sus letterboxes, mm -hmm. right? Same scenario. Those breakings. Young person walked down to get. They're seen to look inside two letterboxes. Mm -hmm. The obvious inference being they're looking to see if there's anybody in there and if there isn't, you know. So it, it caused so much aggravation. So how was that for you seeing all that? If you're trying to do good and you're really trying to clean up crime and get the bad people off the streets and you're seeing this, can that affect your job? I, 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 I didn't have to nick people for sus because, forgive me if I sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but there are some ex-cops that will bear this out. You know, I was very good at nicking people who were actually committing yeah. crime. I'm talking about the people who are making shit up yeah, to get yeah. sentences. Yeah. How was that for you but, then? But you, you, you... I'm 18, 19, 20. Mm. I'm doing a job that I love. There was no such thing as the expression whistleblowing. There was nowhere to go. You would finish your career. Your life would be in tatters if you stepped forward and said... I heard two police officers, you know, in a room 
writing their notes up and fabricating their evidence. Yeah. You know, you'd be shafted because, you know, unless you'd actually been there, you know, and you'd been perhaps like the third officer and you could say, none of this happened. But even mm. then, if you step forward and said that, in those days, you'd be finished. Your career would be over. You wouldn't be believed. You'd be hounded. You'd be hassled. You'd be finished. You a lot would of people wreck your scared life. Scared to come forward and speak yeah. out because of the consequences and the backlash. Yeah, it's funny that people who say, "Oh, I never done anything." There is the majority. A lot of people listen. There's a lot of people in, in prison who's in there for the right reasons. Yeah, I've had a lot of people on the show as well who've been fitted up and done twenty years, twenty five years because of back in the day it was two verbals. I think was enough to charge you. Um, but again, we're as good. There's always we're as bad. There's always good as well. Do you know what I mean? There's always yeah. good people who yeah. make the right choices and do the right things. So what was your idea f for going out of the place? What was your main objective? For, for joining? Yeah. Well, because, because my mum had decided it would be a good idea. You know, I'd mm -hmm. never given it a moment's thought yeah. until I got home and there was this enormous cop sitting in my lounge. You know, he sold the idea. Is he still me. alive? I have no idea. No mm -hmm. idea. No idea. But, you know, I, I have a lot to thank him for. Um... So, yeah, it was as simple as that. There was no history of policing in my family or anything like that. Oh. All down to that fella. So what was your career like then, going through? Right, so Peckham, I'm in uniform. Um, it's 1981, so I've been in uniform for about three years. Um, I'm in what was called a divisional support unit. Right? I'm attached to them, basically. They cobbled together a dozen, a dozen of us cops, put us in a people carrier you know, like a long wheelbase transit with windows and all that sort of stuff. And we would go to any hot spot of crime on the on their patch, you know, and just cover it with loads of officers, stop and search everything and all that kind of stuff, you know. Pretty kind of clumsy policing, but sometimes very successful. Um, and it's a Friday afternoon, and Friday is Poets Day, right? Piss off early, tomorrow's Saturday, right? And we've had a busy week. We've worked very long hours. So we've dropped quite a, a few of the members of our unit off to get in their car and have a flyer on Friday afternoon, get home early, enjoy the weekend, all of that. And there's only about three or four of us left in the van. And suddenly a shout goes up, right, to Routon Road in Brixton. Routon Road was known as the front line. And it was kind of like an area that the Afro-Caribbean population of Brixton had made their own. There was spielers in there. There was illegal drinkers there. There was little gambling dens and all that kind of thing. And some weed got traded on there as well. So back in the day, you know, this is seen as like an area that absolutely must be stamped upon, you know, <laughs> crush the rebellion, all that kind of nonsense, you know. Anyway, shout goes up, urgent assistance required in route and road. You bet we're going to have a lump of that, right? And Brixton's on our neighbouring borough, our neighbouring patch. So we tear up there, and we're one of the first units on scene. It's already very tense. There's little scuffles going on, and it's a bit like that. It's getting a bit standoffish, you know. A um, few things got slung. What, what, what essentially had happened was a young black man had been stabbed, and a police officer was very quickly on scene, and he'd been stabbed in the back. And in order to try and quell the bleeding, to stem the bleeding, the police officer had put his knee over the wound, right, to try and stop the blood spurting out of it. That got misconstrued as this stabbing victim, you know, getting brutalised and arrested and all that kind of stuff. And that's why, you know, the rumours spread very quickly, the atmosphere became toxic very, very quickly. And to kind of cut this long story short, Lots of units came from all over South London as things began to escalate. And then as sort of night fell on that Friday, we all got called off the streets and called back to Brixton. And we were sitting in our vans and trying to grab a sandwich and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And somebody on high, some senior officer, came up with one of the most numbskull frigging decisions that I've ever come across in, the, in in my time in policing. And he said, right, everybody's to get in their vehicles <clears throat> and patrol endlessly in a circle on this Friday night, going up, round and road, down at Tulsa Hill, back down Brixton and round and round and round. Don't stop anybody and search them. Don't get out of your vehicles. 
just patrol, right? So trying to be a presence, right? Complete nonsense. Because all it did was antagonise them, right? And when I say them, I mean the residents of Brixton, you know, particularly, the, you know, the, the black Afro-Caribbean uh, proportion of it. Not exclusively, but primarily. And we just became a very red rag to a very angry bull. It just cranks the tension up. You know, we would see people walking across in front of us with a crate full of empty milk bottles and disappear down into a basement. Well, we knew what was going on. You didn't have to be Sherlock bloody Holmes to figure out that they were going to make petrol bombs. And yet we couldn't get out of the van and stop people. You know, you can imagine there's all the hand gestures and, you know, unpleasant words being mouthed at people and all that kind of stuff. So that carries on, you know, all night. <clears throat> we disappear off, get a bit of kip, come back on a Saturday, and it just kicked off also. I mean, absolute Brixton burn, and it was frightening. It was terrifying. You know, everywhere got looted, places got burnt to the ground, um, hundreds of cops got injured. Miraculously, no cop died, because I was up against people that day who really wanted to kill me because of the cloth that I wore, because of the symbol of oppression that I was. And I can understand it because what had led up to that Friday was Operation Swamp, OK? And that was when they'd put every plain clothes officer they could find into Brixton. And what were they doing? You've got it, fitting people up, mm -hmm. you know, and stopping and searching everybody without any kind of justification. So the whole backdrop to that weekend had been Operation Swamp and, and it kicked off. You can only mistreat people and, you know, have people oppressed for so long yeah. before they rise before up and bite snap. you back. Do you think the, the, like the news and stuff have, has a big part to play in all this? Because the majority of crimes in London, UK, is it white people? Has majority of stabbings and shootings? Is that correct? What, at that time? Yeah, and this time as well. Well, but you know, yeah, you tend to see on the news as uh, a black boy stabbed a black boy or shot. Do you think the news and media can play a massive part on people tr like believing in their mind that the crime is majority of black people and in reality is majority coming from the white people? I've never seen the breakdown of figures about you know Colour. who who who, yeah. who commits crime. Mm. I've, I've 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 never seen those figures, and I want to wouldn't want to give some kind of clumsy guest answer. Yeah. But back in the day, you know, young black men were disproportionately getting fitted up and beaten up. And that is why there was such an uprising, you know, that weekend in Brixton. And and it was a seminal moment for me because when I finally got home, um, you know, I went, oh, nah, I'm getting out of this uniform. You know, I'm just getting out of it. I, Thinking I, about quitting. Did, did, I, did I take the coward's way out? No, I was going to become a detective because... You know, people from the CID had approached me and tried to convince me that I should go down the detective route because I was a good thief taker. You know, I nicked a load of people for burglary and robbery and drug dealing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and so I went down that route and, and got out of uniform as quickly as I possibly could and went down the detective route. Again, could I have stood up and you know, highlighted things and all of that. Quite frankly, if I had done, I'd have been drummed out of it and that would Sacked? Have, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, 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 you know, you did. I'm afraid to say it just wasn't the done thing in those days. People, there, there was no mechanism for being a whistleblower. How tough was it? How, like, tough was it then, back then? No star proof vest? Never had like mace or any of that stuff. Would you just have the baton? I had a wooden truncheon. <laughs> a wooden truncheon. Yeah. If you'd have asked, I'd have brought it with me yeah. today, right? Right. That you was still it. got it. A wooden truncheon. Yeah, yeah, I've still got it. Yeah, I've still got mm -hmm. it at home. And um, yeah, is it more dangerous then? And that was it. Back then. Oh, I think policing's a far more difficult and dangerous job now than it ever was in my life. Really? Oh, unquestionably. Unquestionably. You've only got to look at the amount of police officers that are getting assaulted these days. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I got assaulted, you know. I mean, that, that, that does happen, and you have to accept that if you go into policing, you won't, number one, you won't get rich, and number two, you won't be universally popular, right? And you will come up against violence on, on the front line. 
you know, that, I'm afraid, is inevitable. Do you but, think, though, back in the 70s and 80s, well, even before then, people were more scared of the police because people used to get the shit kicked out of them? Nowadays, there's cameras and people yeah. watching. Do you think that plays a big part? That's definitely an element. You know, there were some police stations that had a reputation, like, don't get taken there. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. like, everybody goes down the stairs, you know. and Say and, they fail. Yeah, and, and Carter Street, Nick, in particular, had a reputation. Just don't... You know, if you were getting nicked, you did not want to go to Carter Street. I ended up working at Carter Street briefly some years later, but, uh, yeah, it had, a, it had a towering reputation as being a tough place yeah. to be taken if you were a prisoner. So what's the transition like from being on the beat to then going a detective? Yeah, well, you kind of do your apprenticeship. So you work for... A, I only did about six months, you know, in your jeans and your T-shirt and that kind of stuff. Then I went on selection board, managed to pass that, and then got transferred to Kensington, in Chelsea, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, if you don't mind, <laughs> okay? and it's all—it's where the whole, you know where where those who are extremely wealthy and have titles and all that sort of stuff um, live, um, as well as having an area south of the Cromwell Road that had some social deprivation, but very different. You know, we hadn't had any of the—I never came across any of the wealth that I was suddenly experiencing in Kensington and different types of crime. Kensington High Street in those days was a go-to place for shopping. So you'd get all the fraud and that kind of stuff. And I came across more and more frequently cocaine because now we're talking about early to mid 80s, the whole explosion of cocaine on the streets of the UK hadn't happened. It was it was in its very, very early days. Um, so, yeah, and, and I got a lot more experience there um, and, and really kind of, yeah, just broaden my my experience and, and had a cracking time, you know, really enjoyed it. The you you know, that, that good old work hard, play hard. You know, so many times me and my mate would walk into Marks and Spencer's in the morning, buy a new shirt, a new tie, a new pair of pants and a new pair of socks. Right? Because invariably we didn't get home a lot. Mm -hmm. What was it like going undercover? Yeah, well, so I finished at Kensington, and of course the next step I wanted to, to make was to become a Scotland Yard detective. And I could see that that whole drugs explosion, particularly with cocaine, was about to happen. And I thought, which is the squad at the Yard that's going to get the resources, the attention, and will be the place to be? It had to be the Central Drug Squad at Scotland Yard. And I managed to get uh, seconded to that squad, went up there, so I bowled through the revolving doors in New Scotland Yard. I'm 25, I'm fearless, I love my job, um, and we had a great time, you know, fighting the war on drugs, right? Because Ronald- It's never going to end. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a war that cannot and will not be won. But, you know, we'll be here for days if you want to hear me spouting, <laughs> spouting off about the nonsense of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And it truly is a nonsense. But at the time, back in the mid 80s, you know, we thought we were on the side of the angels. You know, they're throwing money at us as a squad. Our squad sizes are growing all the time. We're getting more resources, more support, more overtime, and we were being successful. Little did we know that we were completely and utterly wasting our time. Yeah, it's that revolving door. Yeah. yeah, wasting our time. See, I, I personally think they should legalise drugs, but again, a lot of people might not agree, but if they do that, I believe crime rate would really come down legalise opinion on it legalise and regulate yeah you're for it all well. of them all of them why do you think that would make a big difference because it is a multi multi billion dollar pound euro yen call it what you will it's a multi billion dollar global industry right and it is driven by demand the demand for drugs quite simply, will not go away. So people will always supply that demand. It's a business. And yet, we leave it in the hands of criminals. What a nonsense. Would we let criminals run the NHS? Would we let criminals run the railways? All right, some people may say some of, the, <laughs> some of those franchises are a bit dodgy. You know what I mean? But you, you, you get my drift, mm -hmm. right? And there is a massive opportunity now. So let's, let's just boil it down to that criminal that's serving people up in the gloomy pub car park tonight. You know, just 
close to here, close to everywhere in the country, right? They want you to take more. We don't know what's in those drugs when you buy them and when you consume them. You know, it's dangerous. This is about public health as well. I don't want people buying drugs off of criminals. I want people buying their drugs off a licensed, regulated outlet where you know where they've been manufactured, what's gone into them and what the process is and you are advised as to how you should take them. Yeah. Right? People will, will ignore that advice, of course, but, but you know, at least that leaflet's going to be yeah. in that packet, in that box. Because Scotland's a 30% rise in drug-related deaths. I've took many drugs in the past, if I'm honest, Peter, and um, changed my life, but I prefer people never took drugs, but it would be safer if it was done in a more constructive way. Of course. More than, because a lot of people are dying through a street volume, even cocaine, it's... It's crazy. The numbers are only seem to be getting worse, and people, more people are dying. And, and apparently, what I'm told is for people who work with drug-related deaths and families and stuff, it's, it is going to get worse. And in the coming months and years, I don't know if the lockdown plays a part. People depressed, sitting in the house, trying to self-medicate. It's scary times. It's and it's in the times. hands of criminals. Yeah. This industry is in the hands of villains but who don't consider your health. You, yeah. Who want you to consume more. And they want you to consume more of the really addictive stuff because then you'll be back tomorrow, the day after, and the day after that. Mm -hmm. It's a nonsense that we leave this in the hands of criminals. I want drug users to be safe. I want them to know what gear they're taking. And I'm not naive. And by the way, I'm no stranger to drugs myself either, right? Okay, <laughs> there you right? go, Pedro. Okay, you know, yeah, but, no, and, and, and I know people are always going to take them, right? I also happen to know, because I've been there, that somebody who is snorting line after line of cocaine and thinks they are the most interesting person in the room yeah. is invariably as boring as you can possibly imagine. I've been there thinking I'm interesting, yeah. where I'm the exact opposite, you know? And then you're having a joint and suddenly you understand modern jazz. And you, <laughs> and, you know, and you and you want to consume the contents of the yeah. fridge mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I would say, if people think they're hip and they're cool when they're taking drugs, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a Puritan. I know people will, and I, I, but I want them to take safe regulated drugs mm -hmm. you know that we can we collectively can earn taxes from you know to reduce prison population educate people give problematic drug users the right treatment that, that they need yeah we'll be able to afford all that because we'll be making billions and billions and billions from selling the stuff we you know the state will on our behalf or those that they franchise it to and it will be manufactured and, and it will all be regulated. And we won't have stories about people dying through dangerous batches of heroin. You know, when you get that contaminated batch mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it'll come up on the news, won't it? That a city somewhere in the UK has had three, five, seven deaths through a contaminated batch, yeah. you know? Uh, ecstasy, you know, when you get dangerous batches of ecstasy and young people who are determined just to enjoy themselves, tragically lose their lives, we can, like, really, really, you know, put a stop to so much of this mm -hmm. if the political will was there. I'm a big fan and follower of the drug law reform movement. I know some absolutely brilliant people who are at the very heart of it. And we are getting there, but painfully, slowly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we had any kind of political leadership with any kind of brain that appreciated the war can't be won and won't be won, now, of all times, would be the perfect time to hurriedly get the legislation through the House of Commons, right, and get it on the statute book, because what's going to be happening in six months' time? Millions of people unemployed, right? Well, what we could actually do, pass the legislation now, start building the manufacturing plants where these drugs are going to be manufactured, Start employing people to manufacture the drugs. Start getting the retail outlets ready that are going to sell the drugs. And if we beat organised crime on price, purity and availability, the criminals have got nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. All right, they'll end up trying to sell bootleg stuff, like they sell bootleg backy. But if it's more expensive and the quality's worse and you can only get it when the dealer's available 
Why on earth are you going to go down that route when you can go to the high street to what I will clumsily call the drugstore and buy better gear, cheaper gear, and get it 24-7? Mm-hmm. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. What does other people think of you and Matthew that that other polis? Do they agree with you or do they kind of against it? Because yeah, yeah, I, I agree with it. I think it's spot on. I think it will save lives. I think crime will yeah. come down. I think addiction issues, even suicide numbers will drop because people aren't self-medicating with drugs. And there's so many benefits from it. And, and the education that we'll do, because there will be so much money raised through tax revenue, right? You can treat it like cigarettes. Now, I know people still smoke and always will smoke. Mm-hmm. Same as people will always take drugs, right? But my kids, or my two youngest, who are 18 and 19, right? They had smoking educated out of them at school, even though both their parents smoked, right? They had a wonderful wonderful education with regards to smoking and we can do that with kids with regards to drugs because there will be so much money you know you can afford to get it on the curriculum you can afford to employ people to go out and deliver those engaging lessons that kids will latch on to so you know we're not suddenly gonna have high streets full of frigging zombies off their nut walking down a street that Mm -hmm. simply isn't going to happen will there be a little spike perhaps in usage once they're legalised, maybe, but that soon's going to plateau, if not, yeah. you know, decrease. Not wears off, doesn't it? Yeah. So, so going through all that then, with thinking that stuff should be legalised and more protection and stuff like that, what was your, when did you start thinking in those kind of terms, when you realised the war on drugs was a myth, it was yeah, never going to change? After I left the cops. So right. it was after when you started... I, when, I got, when I got medically retired in 1999, mm-hmm. it was then that I kind of, you know, reflected back on my career, you know, because I worked undercover for over a decade, you know, posing as a drug dealer, an arms dealer, a dealer in counterfeit currency, high-value stolen or counterfeit mm-hmm. goods. You know, I plotted to murder people because I was the gun for hire, the assassin and all of that. Medically retired after 21 years, so early, um, and I began to reflect and look back on what I'd done and it kind of dawned on me that so much of my career, unfortunately, was a complete and utter waste of time. Yeah, it's crazy to that, that not that you've worked for trying to get changes and realising if no matter if you get the biggest bust in the world, there's just somebody ready to step in that minute. It's a job creation scheme. Yeah. All you do is create a job vacancy. So doing that, so doing undercover stuff for ten years. When you were saying you were trying to get like guns for hire and plan murders, and what? How did you get in so deep? How were you so trusted? I was a very good liar. <laughs> <laughs> Typical copper, <Right>. innit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my job. Professional liar. What was your first job? Well, actually, undercover? actually, my first job that I did, I did unofficially when I was at Kensington before I went up to Scotland Yard. Right, there was uh, it was off our patch, but somebody uh, got in touch with me and said, "There's uh, a guy supplying LSD in you know significant numbers. Uh, lives just off your patch. Um, he's a very flamboyant gay man, um, and and I didn't know about undercover police. I was just making this kind of tactic up. I thought I was being fresh and original. You know what I mean? And I said, "All right, well, so what we did." got a couple of mates together I said right we'll get a warrant for his house I said but if we can't get in or he, he gets tipped the wink or this that and the other you know the drugs could be you know destroyed and all that sort of stuff we'd have problem with the evidence and what have you so I'm boxing for the police at the time all right so I was rather slimmer than I am today <laughs> shall we say all right I was as fit as a butcher's dog and slim and um, and so I just you know worked it working at Kensington with Earl's Court, I, you know, we had some uh, fantastic gay pubs down in Earl's Court, you know, where we would go and have a drink and mix with people. And so, you know, some of my liberal thinking was beginning to formulate. Um, and uh, I said, well, if this guy is flamboyant and he's gay, um, I'm going to dress up as though I'm a flamboyant gay man. What did you wear? And I'll knock on his door. What did you wear? <laughs> right. I squeezed into a bed. <laughs> no, there'll be. I'm, if you're eating your dinner right now, right, I'm sorry because this is going to put you off. But I squeezed into a very tight pair of jeans, a string vest, 
Friday right. Mercury's do you? Okay, yeah. And, you know, slicked my hair back. And uh, and we, uh, yeah, and, and, and it was fine. And he let me in and we had a chat and I won his confidence. And then I said, you know, I hear you, uh, you, you, you've got some really good LSD. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he went to his cupboard, pulled out sheet upon sheet of them and said, how many do you want? I said, all of them, because you're nicked. And, uh, and then he fell apart, bless him. But anyway, um, so that was sort of like my first dabble into being undercover. But then when I got to Scotland Yard, I realised how they were doing it, you know, like authorised. Did you get a buzz from that then, the first team? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd seen, I'd been on a couple of operations, not being undercover, but as part of the arrest team, you know, and so I'd seen how they were doing it. And uh, one particular job was in the car park of Regent's Park Zoo in London. And there was three undercover cops, two male and one female. And they drove into the car park where they were going to do a trade, I think for four kilos of heroin or something. Um, and they had £70,000 of the commissioner's money in the boot of the car. Well, what had happened in the run-up to that was that the bad guys had asked the female officer to strip because they wanted to check that she wasn't wearing a wire and they felt that if she was a criminal, yeah, she'd have no qualms about, you know, getting her kit off, mm -hmm. right? This female officer declined to do that. So the bad guys thought, hmm, actually, perhaps this lot are just a, a bunch of numpties, you know, and um, we'll think we'll rob them. So when they turned up with the 70 grand in the boot and the bad guy knocked on the window, and the cop wound the wind, the undercover cop wound the window down, squirted with ammonia, you know, in the face and all that sort of stuff, and uh, grabbed the car keys and all that, and they grabbed the holder with 70 grand and legged it. So I was lying on the top deck of a double decker bus on the floor so nobody could see us, you know, as part of the attack team, the arrest team. And when the scream up happened, you know, we all came belting out of the bus and I ended up chasing some bloke off into the the, uh, into the the trees and what have you and eventually caught him. Um, but the 70 grand was missing. And, uh, and it was missing for quite some time. And so the detective inspector who was in charge of that operation could see his career, you know, rapidly disappearing. To cut a long story short, again, we uh, eventually found the 70 grand. It had been put in a skip in the zoo. So the bad guy who nicked it had jumped over the fence, got in the zoo, saw a skip with a tarp over it, pulled the tarp up, stuck the bag in it, pulled the tarp down, carried on legging it, obviously with the intention of coming back to retrieve the money later on. But uh, a member of the public said, yeah, we saw somebody fiddling about with that skip over there, blah, 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 blah. So, so the money got back, you know. Most of the people who robbed the uh, undercover cops got nicked and charged. And I went, do you know what? I think I can do a bit better than that. You know, I don't think they're ever going to rob me. I'll give it a go. Uh, I also saw some undercover cops operating and they were, they would kind of drape themselves in jewellery that they'd borrow from a friendly jeweller in Hatton Garden, the, the jewellery centre of, of London. They'd wear a suit and they'd lounge around in some swanky hotel bar, you know, draped over it you know, big expensive watch and all that kind of stuff. But some of the criminals were just, they, they, you know, they, they, these people are not daft, mm -hmm. right? They're serving up gear for a living and they talk to one another. And after so many people had got nicked in certain hotel rooms, you know, and, they, and, then, and the, the undercover cops wouldn't leave the hotel bar to go and negotiate somewhere. You know, we were having phone taps and listening to people going, you know, if a bloke's in a hotel bar, he's draped in gold jewellery and he won't leave there, he's an undercover cop. You know, we knew these conversations were going on and I felt there was a need to modernise it. You know, if I'm having negotiations with this bad guy and that's all it is, negotiations, you know, I haven't got me 50, 100 grand, 200 grand on the plot, we're just talking business, then I was going to my governors and going, why can't I go with him to his territory? to his flat, to his house, to his favourite bar or restaurant or hotel. Why do I always have to be calling the shots? Let them call the shots. That'll make them feel more comfortable with me. Mm -hmm. You know, and unfortunately, some very brave senior cops went, all right then, you know, and they trusted me. So we kind of rewrote the unwritten rule book 
to a large extent, mm. and were really successful, you know, and did it for years and years. And, you know, me and my colleagues were responsible for hundreds of people getting nicked who were then sentenced to thousands of years inside. But referring to what I said earlier, what was the point? <laughs> it was all a complete and utter bloody was waste of time. Was your life ever in danger? Did you ever have a point where you think, I'm fucked here? Yeah, yeah, oh, countless times. Where's the cut-off point for you to go, right, take a bit of gear, and if you take that, what if somebody threatens you, right, like the girl will take off your clothes, she doesn't? Did you just have, like, a code name, code word? Were there people waiting outside for you to shout out? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes not. You know, sometimes I've had, I'd have a surveillance team watching me. You know, and, and trust me, surveillance ain't how they show it in the movies, you know. Like Donny, two, Donny Brasco was a good... Two cops. Yeah, it's kind was of... Was that right, far-fetched? But, but, no, 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 it was all right. I, I, I know the guy that that was based on. I met him, like, because it was out of our era. Um, but, you know, you'll so often see cops in a movie or in a TV show, you know, there'll be two of them in a car. One will have a cup of coffee and a donut, <laughs> you know, and miraculously, <laughs> they'll be able to follow this car... You know, for hours and hours and hours across hundreds and hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. It ain't like that in the slightest. Surveillance is a mighty fine art. And I take my hat off to all those people that did it in the day for me and, and saved my bacon on a number of occasions and all those people that, you know, continue to do it today, whether they're security services, police, you know, wh whatever background they're from. It's, it's, a, it's a real art and it's a great job if you can do it well. Um, so yeah, they would protect me a lot of the time. Sometimes I would give a particular signal, which would say, I'm fine, stand down, go away. Because I didn't want them, because I knew the bad guys would be taking me somewhere and doing so much counter surveillance stuff that they might spot our surveillance people. So I would just give a particular signal, which the surveillance team knew meant stand down, leave Blex alone, he's fine, he wants to do this on his own. Conversely, there were other occasions, one most notably when I was being held hostage and the, the guy was threatening me that the only way I would have got out of this shop that I was locked into, which was a, a knife shop, believe it or not, was with, as he pointed to the wall, he said, the only way you're getting out of here if you don't bring the money in here is with six of those in your back. And on the wall is like swords, swords and sh machetes and ugly looking daggers and all that and I'd been negotiating for hours and clearly, clearly he meant what he said. Um, so I rang my mate who's my driver, my minder, who's undercover, you know, who's outside and I said, oh mate, yeah, you're right, yeah, 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 fine, yeah, yeah, he's gone, yeah, okay. I said, right, um, do me a favour, mate, you know, when you're ready, bring the money in, yeah? Now he's at the other end of the phone going, has Blex lost his marbles here? Right, you know, I'm going to take this money into this person's you know the, the bad guy that I'm you know negotiating with so my mate m m was thinking Plex has lost it here you know so I said yeah yeah he said are you sure yeah 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 no bring, bring the money in um how long are you gonna be he said well I'll be about 10-15 minutes I said all right lovely lovely 10 or 15 minutes mate oh and by the way before you go Go, yeah, yeah. I said, remember, it's Jackie's birthday tomorrow, so don't forget to get her a birthday card. He's gone, oh, yeah, right. Okay, mate, right, lovely. Cheers, bye. The code word? Jackie's birthday. Jackie's birthday means fucking rescue me. You know, my life is in extreme danger now, and I need rescuing. Um, and so I've stood there, I'm... Chatting to the guy, you know, we're just killing a bit of time, waiting for that. And about 10 minutes later, the front of this shop just freaking disappeared. Just freaking disappeared as my colleagues just like smashed it to smithereens. And a great friend of mine who's sadly no longer with us, Chris Hardy, was first through the door like he invariably was because he had balls of steel. And, uh, and he just wrapped his arms around me and just dragged me out, you know. And, uh, and that was it. They rescued me. After a few See, when hours. you do that and go through something like that where there's potentially you could die, does that make you go, fuck this, I'm, getting, I'm taking a step back? Or does it make no. you more excited to go and do it again? No, I was as daft as a box of frogs, <laughs> weren't I? Do you ever I feel was used? at it the following day. Do you ever feel used? You're getting used to a no. certain degree? No, I was just, I was having a time of my life. You know, I was bringing down career criminals. Mm -hmm. People that have been born into criminal circles that were raised as 
fledgling and then apprentice criminals were career criminals. You know, I'd get in a car with, you know, one notable occasion, not very far from here, funnily enough, and I'm in this car with two guys. I'm in the back, they're in the front, and they're driving me to I don't know where, right, but I've got, like, the best surveillance team following me, right, like the best. And one of them turns around to me and he says, you know what, he said, that old Bill, he said, they've put undercover police into me twice before. He said, twice. He said, but I can smell an undercover old Bill at 100 yards, he said. <laughs> he said, he said, but I know you and you're sound and this is going to be a great business relationship, he said. So I'm really delighted we're doing this. Five minutes later, handcuffed, staring down the barrel of a very long jail term. Didn't smell this one, did you, sir? Fuck's sake. You know, yeah, come on. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. follow a day, come on, let's do it again. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a talent for it. What's the longest you went undercover in one job? About six months. And that was when I was running a warehouse. I had a, a transport warehouse. And um, this, this firm were uh, importing furniture, basically, but of course the furniture was all Harsh. full of gear. Yeah, all full of, all full of gear and, and, and powder. Um, but yeah, so I ran it for months, so their trucks would turn up, you know, unload uh, and disappear. So the, the, the international truck would turn up, we'd unload it, I'd sort all the paperwork out, you know, I, I'd, I'd pretty quickly made myself a bit of an expert on the haulage industry. And then their guys would turn up, you know, with their other vehicles to, to collect part of it and part of it and part of it. But of course, what would happen in the meantime was the minute the international truck had turned up, right? I had guys hidden upstairs, right, who were experts on the tools. So the minute they'd gone, our guys would come downstairs, right? Obviously, we had a uh, like a cordon and an outer cordon so we could tell if any of the other bad guys were on their way to us. And our guys would flip the sofa over, yeah, take it apart, take the drugs out, photograph all the drugs, yeah, gathering all the evidence, put it all back in again, and boom, 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 put the sofa back together. Washing machines, sofas, tables, chairs, you name it. Take all the gear out. So over those months, you know, built up an awful lot of evidence. And eventually when the bosses decided the time was right, they all got scooped up. So see when you're surveillancing someone and you know they've got gear on them, they've got money, do you just let them go that time because you're trying to gather more evidence? It, it depended and it was always a tricky one. Um, particularly if we were dealing with what was then Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, right? We used to clash with them terribly um, because we wanted gear to run because our attitude was we'd rather capture a big gangster with a smaller amount rather than a small runner with a large amount. But the Customs were completely the opposite, you see. They, they would think that a big seizure was a result. Well, to us, if you've got a big seizure and all you've got is the patsy that was driving the van, you know, or the person that had strapped it to their body, you know, say six kilos of coke, and they've walked through Heathrow Airport. If that's the only person you've arrested with it, you know, when we know the network that lies behind it, you know, and we want the gear to run, we want that body-packed courier to go to an address with us keeping them under surveillance, so when they take the gear off, and somebody higher up the chain comes to collect the gear, you know, that's a better job, isn't it? That's more evidence. You're, 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 you're making a bit more of a dent in it, so we thought. You know. Did you go undercover in your area that you were working, or did you have to go out? No, I, I mean, I worked in London, obviously, all Everywhere. the time, but, but, you know, I'd sometimes get invited for tea and a cucumber sandwich with the commissioner, you know, to get, mm. a, to get a commendation or something, you know? And, and, and it was quite astonishing, because some of these bosses would say, you know... Peter, you've been doing this for years, you know, you've had numerous successful operations. Um, how is it that, you know, you're able to keep doing it for years and years? I said, well, you've just got to understand the scale of the industry that we're up against now. You know, I can take out one lot and then go and work with another lot and they won't be connected in any way, shape or form. I'd always do a bit of background research as well to make sure that that team wasn't connected in any what way. What was your biggest team. bust? Well, I suppose we took out, I mean, it, they look like paltry numbers now, really paltry numbers, but this is, you know, the yeah, mid-80s to the mid-90s. Um, we took out tonnes of cannabis frequently, um, but in terms of powder, we took out 35 kilos of cocaine, 
Uh, we took out 15 kilos of heroin, which at the time was the biggest landside seizure of heroin at the time. But let's just put it in a context, right? Last week at Dover, yeah. the National Crime Agency and the Border Force seized a ton yeah. of cocaine. I think one right? of the guys was from Glasgow. Yeah, 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 but not charged. So they yeah, arrested they get two out? people. Why is that? Uh, but so, so that's a, you know, I'm glad we're discussing this, right? So the National Crime Agency are splashing it all over their social media. And I get that, right? It's a ton of Charlie. It's a lot of gear. I mean, you imagine if that, so that metric ton, those thousand kilos of cocaine, a thousand kilos, and I'm talking about season 35 back in the 80s, right? It kind of just gives you all the evidence you need to, to know that this is such a point, this war, right? That thousand kilos at what I will call the jungle gate, okay? So in Colombia, right? For example, if it's being manufactured in Colombia, right? When it leaves that manufacturing process, that kilo of cocaine, one kilo of cocaine will be about, 1,500 quid, 1,500 pounds, right? Cheap as chips, isn't it? Right? You know, compared to what? Street value. It, yeah, yeah, what's charged over here. So there's a 1,000 tonnes at 1,500 pounds per kilo, 1,000 kilos at 1,500 pounds per kilo. That's one and a half million, right? And that's factory gate prices, you know what I mean? That's before it's been mm -hmm. transported. So somebody's either owing somebody in South America an awful lot of money or they're going to have to serve up an awful lot more drugs to pay off that debt, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And they will. You know, they, 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 they will. It's kind of, it's just a nonsense. But the encrypted phones just now, which have all been busted, everybody's fucked. It's in the UK. Not man. everybody. It's not not everybody was on Encroach chat. Oh, no, 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 no. Some very smart people have other ways. For anybody that was on that, though, is fucking dumb, man. Because there's always a way of cracking any code or any... They say the CIA actually made those phones for that to happen. To gather up an, enough information and then, boom, they've took down fucking the, the full of the UK, man. Yeah, but there's knowing something and there's proving it, which are two completely different things. So let's go back to that tonne of cocaine seized at Dover last week, right? One guy arrested from London and one guy arrested from Glasgow. Mm -hmm. They've both been released under investigation. They're not even on bail. Yeah, but so they've they, been well, released they under have, investigation. They couldn't have been there then. Well, they, they couldn't have the. They, they clearly didn't have the evidence yeah. to charge them at that point. Mm -hmm. So you know, what's the point of seizing a ton? And, and, and not charging anybody at the moment. Yes, yeah, so they've just caught a container of drugs, but not really yeah. anything behind it. Yeah. But who says that container's not been caught and then another 10 has been allowed through? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You yeah. know, a, a conservative, well, a, an optimistic estimate, I think, you know, the Border Force and the National Crime Agency think they, they seize 10%, don't they? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. But, you know, we all, we all know that it's absolute cobblers that this war on drugs is allowed to perpetuate. But part of the big problem is that Mrs Miggins, who lives in her Cotswold cottage, right, and reads the Daily Mail every day, is convinced about the evilness of drugs and that the war on drugs must still be fought, right? And she would go absolutely apoplectic if her MP voted for the legalisation of drugs. And it's that kind of mindset you've got to change. But, Mrs Miggins, let me tell you, no matter what town, village, hamlet or city you live in, your grandchildren are surrounded by drugs, courtesy of county lines. And I'll come to your house, Mrs Miggins, if you invite me, and I'm, I'm house trained and I'm quite polite and all of that. You know, and we'll have a cup of tea and a biscuit. I have. I'll bring the biscuits, and I guarantee you, within half hour, I could get served up gear and bring it to your house because the drugs are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So don't think for a moment, Mrs. Miggins, please, Mrs. that Miggins. this that this war is being won. Yeah. How did because you? It isn't. How did you get medically medically discharged? What happened? 
Right, so I got involved in a job which was very complex. Me and a guy from the customs went undercover as a team and there was a lot of different agencies involved in this. There was the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency from America, the FBI, the Garda Shikana, the police from Ireland, customs, obviously police in the UK and others. Very complex, lots of infighting amongst different agencies. Uh, but anyway, on the ground actually doing the job was me and my colleague from the customs. I ended up being in a hotel in Gatwick at Gatwick Airport and uh, one of the bad guys delivered 15 kilos of heroin to me, right? Um, and at the time, as I think I said earlier, that was the largest landside seizure of heroin in the UK, believe it or not. It took me three or four hours to weigh and test it because they were in half kilo packages. So I had to weigh and test every half kilo package, you know. And why did I do that to each and every one? Well, number one, because they thought we were going to be doing future business. So let's be professional. You're going to weigh everyone, aren't you? You're paying a freaking lot of money for this gear, right? A lot of money. Um, so I'm weighing and testing it all. I'm testing it in a pretty unscientific way by burning it on a, on a piece of foil and seeing the residue that was left. And actually, it was quite, there, there was a lot of kind of thinking behind my method. If there was a lot of residue left, then you were burning a lot of sugars and you weren't burning a lot of heroin. If there was very light residue left on the foil, then you knew it was banging gear. And of course, I was so familiar with gear because I've been buying it for years. I could tell by the smell and by the look of it and the texture of it, no matter what the gear was, whether it was, you know, good gear. Even so. So I've done those 30 parcels and then I've had to seal them back up and weigh them all and all that kind of stuff. And it bought a lot of time because there's money being held in safety deposit boxes elsewhere that is then going to be exchanged. So, you know, around the country, other people are being kept under surveillance with a view to gathering evidence and arresting them, right? So me and this guy leave the hotel room. We're going to go downstairs, have a celebratory drink. Cheers to the start of a very long and a profitable business relationship. That's the plan. We get as far as the lifts, of course, you know, press the door, and then all of a sudden, people that have been dressed as chambermaids and waiters and all that kind of stuff in the full hotel get out, right? Actually aren't. They put their friggin' checkered caps on, pull their guns out, and force me and him to the floor and handcuff us. Very kind of... Uh, unceremoniously you know just on that note right the bloody arms police used to irritate the shit out of me because i would go to briefings right and i'd get wheeled on towards the end of the briefing because the di or the dci given the briefing would say and now it's time for you to meet our undercover operative right and so i walk on right they can see what i'm wearing see what i look like right and i would say please i know you will want to make this look authentic but please remember that I am one of you guys and girls, right? We're on the same side. So if you do have to arrest me and put the handcuffs on, could you please just remember that I'm not a bad guy, right? You know, they never did. Bang, slam me into the ground, <laughs> stick my arms at me back, put the cuffs on, ouch, oh, you <laughs> bastards, right? And I don't know what, you know, maybe they just felt, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, that happened a few times. So, me and a guy slammed on the ground, handcuffed, right? Um, he's kept in custody, as are other people who've been arrested, you know, around the, that case at the different locations. And then they all end up in court a couple of days later, and they're in the dock, and all of a sudden they're going, well, where's that cocky South Londoner with the ponytail, right? Because I'm not in the dock with them. And they've had plenty of time to figure out, and they go, ah, undercover cop so they thought kill me kill the evidence and to an extent you know they were right so you had a ponytail yeah yeah halfway down my back yeah <laughs> so um, yeah I, yeah um so so anyway you know being threatened and all that kind of stuff wasn't necessarily too much of an issue it went with the territory you know that was part and parcel of the job and and is policing per se I shouldn't think there's many police officers who've not been threatened, if any. Um, so that in itself wasn't too much of a, an issue because they weren't going to be able to find out my real name and my address or anything like that, even though I've got an unusual name. You know, I had a number of false identities 
that were created by me and supported by the unit at Scotland Yard. So it wasn't, wasn't a major problem. Um, however, because the case had been so complex and there'd been so much infighting between different agencies and there was a load of aggrav aggravation going on, which was largely hidden from me because I didn't need to know about it. I'm just working undercover and, you know, drinking and eating and spending time with the bad guys and convincing them that I'm the real deal. Um, a report was compiled by one of the officers in the case because the deputy commissioner was going to go into battle with customs and the FBI and the DEA and all that sort of stuff. So the man who compiled this report didn't put my number, right, my code number, which is allocated to me by the undercover unit at the yard. He didn't put that code number in there when he was mentioning me. Oh, no, 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 no. Detective Constable Peter Blexley, right? And there's not many Blexleys around. I think there's only 14 of them in the country, and I've fathered most of them, right? <laughs> and only three of them, right? Honest. Um, um, you know, and my name, repeat, the, the, I've got the document still, six pages long, and my name repeatedly crops up my full name, right? So that's the first ricket. The second is that that report is printed off and taken out of the police building, right? Ricket number two. Ricket number three, he puts it in a suitcase, puts it in an unmarked car, right? And drives off out of the police building, right? Error number three. Number four, he decides to go shopping on his way home from work. <laughs> what has been tanned? Right? Shopping. You've got it, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And that report <laughs> is nicked. So now... The threat to kill me, which, by the way, was detected by the FBI on a phone tap in Boston, Massachusetts, right? So now there's a threat to kill me and there's the stolen report with my name in it. Should those two things get married together, I am in very, very real danger. You know, this is... Is that set up? Did he mean that? I spent two years in witness protection driving myself quite simply mentally ill over that, thinking about it, right? I did, and drinking too much and all of that. So so one night, I get a phone call, don't go home from the bosses at the yard. Why not? Don't, we'll tell you in the morning, get to the yard, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, book into a hotel, use one of your false um, identities, get your girlfriend to go to your flat, get an overnight bag, and be here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, I got to the yard at eight o'clock the following morning, despite the fact that I smashed the granny out of the minibar in the hotel because I'm sitting there thinking, what's going on with my life? You know, why can't I go home? Right, get to the yard, eight o'clock. My mate says, have you seen this? And he's got the report. I said, no. He said, right, you keep this, right? You keep that copy. And he locks me in a little side office where, like, nobody ever went. He said, and read that. Well, I couldn't believe it. You know, my name all over it, detailing everything I'd done in the operation, the fact that the bad guys wanted payment by guns if we weren't going to pay them in money, the links to terrorism, the FBI phone tap, you know, and all of that. And I'm going, jeez. By the close of play that day, the uh, powers that be at the yard had decided that I had to move into the witness protection programme immediately. And so began the two darkest, most miserable years of my life. I still had to work. I mean, on any given day, I'd be three different people, right? So I get up in the morning, <laughs> right? So, so this is a hideout, right? This is not home. Mm -hmm. This is a hideout, right? Mm -hmm. And I hated it because I'm a neighbourly sort of chatty kind of bloke, you know? So I get up in the morning and there, sitting on my doormat, is the post in the name that I'm living in, in witness protection, obviously, right? So that's the first reminder, you know, of that name and where I'm living and all of that. Then I'd leave the front door and go to the car, right, to drive to work, having checked under it first to make sure that no bastard hadn't put a bomb under it, right, which was a very real threat, right? What the neighbours must have thought of me, like, you know, anyway... Then I drive to work. So for that hour driving to work, my favourite hour of the day, right? Turn the radio on, listen to whatever station I want to, you know, all that kind of thing. Because I'm myself for an hour, right? <laughs> I'm free, I'm myself <laughs> for an hour. And then I get to work and the governor goes, Blex, another undercover job coming. Want you to do it. 
And I go, oh, yeah, OK, go. all right. So, you know, by about 11 o'clock in the morning, I've already been three different people. And this went on day in, day out. And, of course, when I got home, I drank too much because I'm thinking, like you've said, well, how could this report have my name in it? How could it be printed off? How could it go in a car? How could it be stolen? You know, driving myself bonkers over that, drinking too much, smoking too much, and had a catastrophic mental breakdown. Yeah, too many too many coincidences for that to happen and then it go missing. I had a man called Neil Woods on the podcast, a former undercover, a real good guy. Um, struggles with PTSD. He says a lot of the police officers have drinking problems because of the stuff that they see. Um, murder, crime, kids getting abused. Do you think there's enough stuff for police to help them talk about the problems that they see? At the time, for me, there was very little. They hurriedly cobbled some stuff together and got me in front of a psychiatrist who I could not stand. You know, private job and all that stuff. NHS was miles better, by the way. And they were the people that fixed me, not the private bloke and the private hospital and all that stuff. Um, and by the way, Neil Woods is one of my heroes. Good I guy, think, man, yeah. He's a wonderful man. Yeah, he's doing and big a real, things. real campaigner for drug law mm -hmm. reform. Um, I, I fear that there isn't the um, the processes in place that there should be. There is some, but I had an undercover cop ring me mm, three or four months ago and he went through circumstances quite similar to mine and he was having his issues, you know, and I tried to help him, of course. Um, and he didn't feel that there had been enough psychological support for him. Um, I think they should do. I think mental health is extremely important for us all. And we're being really challenged these days, aren't we, by lockdown and all of that. And I've had some friends who I've helped out with their mental health issues. And I would like to think that anybody that's in my life knows they can pick up the phone and talk to me. Talking is key. Getting the right help is key. You know, speak to your GP as a first port of call. Hopefully get referred to the services that you need. If you are prescribed medication, please take it. I know some people resist that, but I'm still on medication. What right? do you take? All these years later, uh, Respiridone, right? What's that? It's kind of like a, an antipsychotic episode of drug, I think. And I take a tiny dose. I take one milligram a day, right? You know, and it's come down over the years. And my GP would like to see me off it. Right, completely. But it works for me. My mental health is incredibly robust. Yeah, I'm well, I enjoy life. So why would I take the risk? Because in the past, when I've been on other medication, bearing in mind I first got mentally ill towards the end of 94, 95, you know, when I was first hospitalised, and I had another episode in the mid noughties where I was hospitalised again, you know, um, and I've been, I've, I've had just about every diagnosis you could imagine, right? None of which I think are particularly accurate. You know, at one point I was diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia. Well, clearly I didn't have chronic schizophrenia. You know, there was something massively wrong. You know, and at the opposite end of the scale, I, I've been um, diagnosed as suffering from anxiety and depression. You know... I'm, I'm, I'm clearly somewhere in between those two stalls, or I have been on the two occasions that I've been ill. Psychosis, yes, I think so, yeah. But now, you know, I take that tiny maintenance dose, I'm well, you know, I'm acutely aware that I've got to be on red alert with regards to my mental health because it would be dreadfully unfair on those who have supported me so well, i.e. my yeah. family, you know, over the years, to do anything risk, uh, reckless to put it at risk again. How so, does the so paranoia like and stuff, the, like after when you stop, like the paranoia and like threats to your life and getting into witness protection, how does that affect you? Because obviously, if you're going through all that, then there's got to be a, a, a touch of psychosis where to go undercover, knowing that you can die at any minute, to be a different character all the time, that must eventually shut the nervous system down and constantly be on edge. So it's obviously going to take effects, years, 10, 20 years. It's like, not self-harming, but it's a sense of abusing yourself, eh? having to be different characters all the time, not knowing what's right and wrong in life and being, it's like a split personality. Because your brain doesn't know what's real or what's fake. So if you're going into character, three different characters a day, 
one just you, Peter, the next, the undercover cop, and then the one that's in fucking witness protection. No wonder you're fucking kind of fucked up. <laughs> it's not a great surprise, is it? Right? 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 And, when you, and when, you, when you throw into the mix, right? Throw into the mix the fact that the bloke who ran the off licence, yeah. right, saw an awful lot of me, mm-hmm. right? You can imagine. Yeah. It was, it was a melting bottom. pot that was just yeah. bound. So how are you now then? Getting blowed. all because you you came a celebrity now. You kind of wrote your books. You've been on TV numerous occasions. Yeah. So how yeah. do you feel now that you've put all these people behind bars for thousands of years? Have you ever met anybody you've put behind bars after that came out? I got connect, I got contacted via social media just a couple of weeks ago. What would they say? Guy. Yeah, you yeah. yeah, bastard. We're, no, we're meeting for a drink. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go and have That's a drink. Mad. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna go and have what a drink. What did they say? Yeah, yeah, it's just like you know. You and I spent some time together in the, you know, back in the day in the nineties, and uh, you know, I served you up some stuff and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we're going to go and have a have a meet and a chat. And in fact, um, I hope he won't take any offence, but he, he he asked to be put in contact with somebody, you know, from the media world, and mm. and I facilitated that for him, and I'm only too happy to do that. You know, I believe in second chances. Yeah, you know, I completely believe in second chances all right there might be some people whose actions are clearly beyond the pale right and don't but the overwhelming majority of us all deserve a second chance yeah i think in life we get more than second chances it's thousands of chances we get because yeah. we fuck up every day we make mistakes every day it's just how far you want to learn from them and grow from them to become a better person it's life it's a roller coaster as you clearly yeah. see no matter what side of the fence you're on it's a roller coaster so when you're going through all that then through the Witness protection and coming up. When did you come away from the police completely? Uh, I was medically retired in 1999. So I'm coming up to 40 years of age, right? Flunked me education. Haven't got many exams to fall back on. No trade, you know, nothing like that. All I knew was policing. And I'm on the scrap heap of life. Um, and I've still got my mental health battles to uh to deal with but then you know i thought i've got a story to to tell i was a bit irritated by the way that the cops had dealt with me so i wanted to tell it from my perspective um and i decided well i hoped that i was going to write a book my autobiography so i went out for a drink with a former colleague who i'd been very close to and he threatened me he said you won't write this book you will not write a book I went, I'm not in the police anymore. You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me that I'm not going to write a book. And so that meeting, you know, was cut pretty short. But then I did, you know, got got the publishing deal, had some help to write the book, and it did all right. It proved popular. It's still out there now, you know, like re-released in 2017, and a few people buy it every year, you know. And What's the book touch. called? It's called The Gangbuster. Mm-hmm. And it's still out there on Amazon and stuff, and people still enjoy it. It's a real, you know, boy's own tale of of of, of daring do and mm-hmm. all the stuff I did, you know, with the honesty of my breakdown in there. Because um, mental health and being honest about your mental health is really important, I think. Um, so yeah, got got the contract um, for that book. That came out, did okay. Um, and then my wife and I had a couple of kids. You know, and uh, so I spent some years being the full-time house husband. As a result of the gangbuster, I got engaged as a story consultant to a BBC television drama, which was called Murphy's Law, where Jimmy Nesbitt played uh, an undercover cop called Tommy Murphy. They'd done two series of the show, but it was a bit of a cartoon caricature of how the undercover world was, you know, one week he'd be a brain surgeon and the next week he'd be a nun or something, you know what I mean? I'm being a bit flippant, but (laughs) when I came on board with Series 3, we completely reinvented the show, um, gave it an anchor in reality as much as we could. We're making a drama, you know, not a documentary. And um, and it did really well, got nominated for the best BAFTA. uh, and we had three gate series of that before after five series of BBC said, yeah, and, and decommissioned it. But that was good, you know, and I was kind of in the media now, um, doing a lot of commentary on 
crime and policing and that kind of stuff in the news, etc., etc. Got other consultancy gigs. Started wanting to do, you know, my own writing, my own plays and stuff. I've written three plays for Radio Four. Uh, got the Hunted gig, that show on Channel Four. That was good. Which that. kind of really raised yeah. my profile. Um, did six series of that. Four of the main show two of the uh, celebrity version. Why did you stop that? Because in series four, which was my last series of the main show, we caught them all. <laughs> Classic Peter, isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. There were so many people who were upset and uptight about it. But it was, I kid you not, it was one of the greatest days of our lives when we caught the lot. You know, there'd been a lot of really brilliant investigative work that led us to that point. And, uh, and it was, yeah, you know, I, I liked being the party pooper in chief, you know what I mean? So they didn't get to enjoy the money. None of them got their grubby little hands on that hundred <laughs> grand, <laughs> lovely. We sport the party and I loved it. And um, yeah, and I just looked at it, you know, it was swallowing up my summers and, and, and all of that. And I just went, I'm, I'm never gonna be able to top that. We caught them all. You know, you just cannot beat that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, time to time to bail out. So how now though that after being retired and doing what you're doing, you're still active of being trying to catch fugitives? And we'll touch on this now. Um, the Peter, the the guy you're trying to catch who is wanted for double murder, was he from Liverpool? Right. So what's this story? How did this become about? Let me just tell you, okay. I have an energy and enthusiasm for work that I had when I was half my age. I love working. So when I left Hunted, you know, I was thinking about what my next major project would be. My publisher said, yeah, you can do another book. Yeah, if you get the right subject for it. Um, and I thought, right, yes, I've written plays for Radio 4 and three previous books and all of that, but I'm best known for catching pretend fugitives in a bloody entertainment show. So... Think of all those things, put them together in the mix, and instead of writing about unsolved murders, which is what my previous two books had been, I thought, yeah, let's go and hunt a real fugitive. You know, it makes the most of my skill set, what I'm known for, my contacts, my experience. Yeah, let's hunt a real fugitive. And believe you me, they do not come any more wanted than six foot six, Liverpudlian, broadly built, and still with an athletic build, by the way, so he's keeping himself fit. How do you know? Kevin Parle, I know lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are certain stuff that I can't say how I know, right? So 29th of April, I had a press conference in London, because, you know, I'm a Z-list celebrity, so some people popped along to it. It was great. There was big hitters there, like Danny Shaw from the BBC was there, and, um, you know, the press agency were there, and National Newspaper and all that stuff. Great, because this bloke, Kevin Powell, is wanted not for a double murder. He is wanted for two separate murders. And the fact that he is not a household name is something that I would like to change. He's not been convicted, as I said way back at the beginning, right? But he's very much wanted for both of these crimes. And he should stand in a court and answer the allegations. They are both ghastly, ghastly crimes. The first one, June 2004. The murder of Liam Kelly, a 16-year-old boy. Right? Now... Nobody has described him to me as a model student. I get that. In fact, some people have spoken about him quite disparagingly to me. But he was 16, right? I was a pain in the arse when I was 16. Liam was denied the opportunity to mature, to grow, to enter manhood, to find a partner, to have a family that he could provide for through lawful means. He was denied all of that because he was gunned down in the street. And a court has been told that Kevin Powell pulled the trigger. Three people have been convicted in connection with Liam's crime, but Powell was the man the court was told pulled the trigger. And so he has to be found to answer that allegation. The second crime, 
So I'll just show you the victims. There's Liam, right? And there's Lucy. August 2005, Lucy Hargreaves, a 22-year-old mother of three young children, blasted to death with a shotgun as she lay on the sofa in her own home, which is then set on fire. People have told me that Lucy is as beautiful, was as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside, roundly loved and adored. The allegation is that three men went through the front door of Lucy's home intending to shoot her partner, a man called Gary Campbell. But they were so incompetent, they were so friggin' useless, that they took away the life of an entirely innocent, beautiful young woman who had three young children and her whole life to look forward to. I've been to Liverpool numerous times, of course, since I started my hunt for Kevin Parr. And the revulsion that is so widely held by people at Lucy's murder runs very deep. And there are many, many people that would like to see Kevin Parr arrested because that is a crime that he is wanted for. So how does that, now that you're in the public eye and speaking openly about it and doing everything that you can to create awareness and create publicity, does that not give the person on the run the upper hand though, knowing that you're coming for them instead of moving in silence? Kevin Thomas Powell, okay, has all the advantages. All the advantages. He doesn't have to obey the law. I do. So I'm not going to hack people's computer, for example. I'm not going to illegally access information, for example. Because there is absolutely no point of Kevin Powell being in one cell and me being in the cell next to him. And I am not universally popular. There are many people that have Kevin Powell's best interests at heart that want to see me fail. And they have threatened me. And they have abused me. And they have posted photographs of my home address on social media on one occasion with an accurate description of the bedroom that I live, that I sleep in, right? There are people on his side. But through our BBC podcast, and I was very fortunate that the BBC supported my hunt for him, and that podcast, which is Manhunt, Finding Kevin Powell, has had over two and a half million downloads. People love it. There's 12 episodes out there and it will be coming back. But my investigation is at a rather sensitive stage at the moment. And obviously I can't put information in the public domain that's going to benefit Kevin Parle and tip him the wink. But please, go on to BBC Sounds and have a listen to the podcast. And once again, I will plug my recently published book, yeah, Man Hunt, right? Because these are two different things, right? And if you read the reviews, say, for example, on Amazon, you will see there are people who loved the podcast and still thoroughly enjoyed the book because that is not a carbon copy of that. Where can people get it. the book? The book's on... Amazon, it's online. If you if you Google it, Waterstones have got it, mm -hmm. Coles books have got it. You know, you'll find it. And if you go to, by the way, and I, I, this would be remiss of me not to mention it, if you go to theworks.co.uk, it's four quid, right? And people are saying the most remarkable things about it. I'm deeply, deeply flattered and humbled. Those that are buying it and reading it would appear to be loving it and that's kind of you know i'm, I'm glad people are, are enjoying my writing so plans for the future then we find kevin everything and this is your main objective just find now. kevin Powell, right and yeah. since this book has come out okay it, it's it's achieving what i wanted it to achieve in other words it's prompting people to come forward and, and speak to me right i am so easily contactable right i'm peter blexley on instagram Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, easy. Unusual spelling of my name, of course, B-L-E-K-S-L-E-Y, right? I've got a mobile phone number, 
set up specifically to receive information about Kevin Pohl. 07908 617 694. You know, my email address is out there. If you just Google me, I've got a website. You can message me through the website. I could not be more contactable. And let me tell you this, if I may, right? Mm -hmm. Kevin Powell will be found. I don't care how old your information is, right? Because past information is often an indicator as to future behaviour, right? And I had some great stuff that's been coming in the last couple of weeks since the book has been out about, right, now get this. Now, I don't know whether it's true or not, right? Kevin Powell does not come from Toxteth, Norris Green, Croxteth, or any of those other parts of Liverpool, right? He came from the south of the city, right? I won't give the name where his parents lived, or be the family don't live there anymore. Nice street, you know, semi-detached, extended semi-detached. You know, people take great pride in the street. He did not come from the tough part of the city. He went to a private school, right? And he started doing a degree, but he was a wannabe. He wanted to be one of the big guys. In the early days, I mean, he is big, he's six foot six. In the early days, right, I've had people contact me and said, he was a clown, right? He was like the designated driver for the urchins who were a Liverpool football club firm, right? Because he was mad for cars, right? Loved driving, yeah? He tried to prove himself at a motorway service station when they're driving to watch Leicester away, right, and impress the kids because the kids were all the, the real tough nuts of that wonderful city would let him deal with, right? Yeah, you run the kids, right? He tries to impress them by stealing a pizza, eh? Crime of the century, takes it outside the motorway services and gets stopped by security. And he goes, oh, sorry, goes back in and pays for it, right? We're not talking about Premier League gangster here, right? He was a wannabe who wanted to prove himself. And that perhaps... I say only perhaps, right, but think about it, may lie behind Liam's murder, for which he's not yet been convicted. Let me just, you know, forgive me. How old me. was it when... Liam, point, 16. How old was... Uh, 24. When that's happened? Yeah. Yeah. Right? 24. So when you think about those things, right, and you put them in a context, they might be right, okay? He was a charmer, legendary when it came to chatting up women and charming them into bed. Right? Absolutely legendary. A number of people have told me about that. He had one particular chat up line, which was, we should do breakfast sometime. <laughs> right? But anyway, you know, it seemed to apparently work for him. Right? So, um, you know, are, are these things true? Yeah, they come from very credible sources. Since the book's come out, more stuff about the past. Uh, about the past. He hung about with a guy called Chubby Allen, Right? That was his nickname, right? I don't know who Alan is yet. Alan, contact me, you know, because I will find out who you are. You know, somebody's going to say, oh, yeah, chubby Alan is so-and-so, so-and-so. There was another boy who was extremely good-looking, apparently, and he had the nickname Soft Boy, right? Well, I'm going to find out who Soft Boy is. And I know it's from many years ago, but you never know whether there is any ongoing connection or what they might be able to tell me about him then is useful now, right? Your city... The wonderful city of Glasgow, another city I'm deeply fond of and have been to many times, right? Paul used to go to Glasgow, used to go to the Corinthian, right? You know the Corinthian, yeah, yeah. right? Used to like it in there, right? Would book into Glasgow hotels and put a briefcase over the counter and ask for that to go in the hotel safe. So what did it contain? I'm guessing here, drugs, money, weapons, I don't know. Please, wonderful people of Glasgow. If you worked in that hotel or you were part of the people that he was getting up to criminality with in Glasgow, please tell me, because I will find out. You know, I've been you know, I've just got this stuff. I've been I've been at it for 18 months on my own. Do you think you were right? from the tire? No. Right? Uh, this is my life's work now, mm -hmm. is to find Kevin Paul. It is my life's mission. As long as I am drawing breath can put one foot in front of the other and can bash a keyboard, I am hunting Kevin Powell. And the world is shrinking for him. Every book that gets sold, every download of the podcast, 
Every flyer I hand out, the world shrinks for him bit by bit. And let me, if I may, can mm. I carry on? Yes, take your right. stage. Kevin Powell, quite obviously, because it's the only, it's the only conclusion one can come to, right? Because he's been on the ramp for sixteen years. He's a bright fella, by the way. He's a very bright fella. So many people told me. How do you know he's alive? Intelligent and smart. Trust me, I know he's alive, right? If you listen to that podcast and you read that book, all the evidence is in there. Forgive me, I'm not, but but yeah, I, know, yeah. I know he's alive, right? I know he's alive. Don't believe the urban myth about him being chopped up and slung over a boat in the Mediterranean and all that. It's not true. Uh, and anybody who wants to perpetuate that myth, fine, prove it, please. You know, contact me, prove it. I've had people before trying to prove it, right? And they talk about he went to such and such a place and met so and so and this happened and that happened, right? And I sit down, map it all out, look at the chronology and it's manifestly untrue, coupled with the fact that I've got witness testimony to say that he is very much alive. Okay, so Kevin, Paul, is being harboured by people involved in serious criminality, harboured and funded by people involved in criminality. It's obvious. It can be the only conclusion that anybody can come to, right? Because he's not living in a mansion and he's not living a life of luxury, right? I can tell you that. He's not, okay? Harboured and funded by people involved in serious criminality. Of that, I am sure it seems to be the, the, proper, the proper theory to work on, right? Now, holding that thought, just imagine, just imagine if I knew who was harbouring him the criminality that they were getting up to, who their network was, how this was transported there and that was transported to another place, right? And connection and connection and connection. Imagine if I knew all that information. So it's not just one charge that can be a few? Just imagine if I knew all that information, right? I deliberately set my parameters very narrow. Right? In so much as that, I just want to see Kevin Powell in front of a court of law. I'm not interested in who's serving up who. I'm not remotely interested in who arranged for that tonne of cocaine to arrive in Dover last week. Right? I'm not interested in what gangster killed what gangster. And I've been told loads about all those crimes, right? I'm not rushing off to the police to tell them, right? That's for them to investigate, right? I'm an investigative writer. And I want to find Kevin Powell for Liam and for Lucy. Right? It's ain't about Powell, it's only about Peter. It's about Liam and Lucy. So, picture the scene, right? Let's hypothesise for a moment, right? That I discovered everything about those harbouring him, funding him, what they're doing, who they're doing it with and how they're doing it. Right? I'd offer him a deal. And I'd say, you deliver Kevin, okay? You hand him over. You ensure that he is captured. And I solemnly promise that the secrets I know about you and your very lucrative criminality will forever remain just that. Secrets. But, you know, this is a deal. I'm not threatening anybody. Please don't think I'm threatening anybody, right? I don't have any guns. I don't have a gang. This is me, my pen, my notebook and my mobile phone, right? So I'm not threatening anybody because I'm not in a position to threaten anybody. But I could, if I knew all those things, offer that deal. Hand him over and I won't say a word to anybody. I'll delete all the files yeah, I'll destroy... I've, I've got cyber experts that can make any information that I might have about their networks and all that sort of stuff disappear so that even GCHQ couldn't find it, right? A deal is a deal. That is the deal I would offer. 
hand him over and those secrets will forever remain secret. Choose not to accept this deal and do whatever you want to do to try and put me off, throw me off the scent, move him around, hide him more, harbour him more, all that kind of stuff. Then it may get to the situation, mightn't it? Whereby all those secrets that I know about the people harbouring him, funding him, their criminality, their associates and how they do what they do, I might then be forced into a corner, mightn't I? Where I have to go to the National Crime Agency and say, here you go. Here is a very comprehensive and thorough intelligence package about people involved in serious and organised criminality of the most... Is that Serious why? Nature. Because is that why you're getting threats address put online because you're digging and you're starting to unravel more stuff that's the connection to it all? Courageous, wonderful people are coming forward and speaking to me. Have you spoke to the parents of Liam uh, and Lucy? Right from the off, when my great friend and podcast editor, Mark, and I went to Merseyside Police, we said we would like to speak to Liam and, Liam and Lucy's families. And uh, the police have been a, a firewall between us and the families. That's fine. They said, actually, that the families don't want to talk to us at this stage. And that's fine. I have to respect their position, of course. It's all about the, you know, the, the loved ones they lost. It's all about Liam and Lucy. But none of them have expressed any objection to what I'm doing. Yeah, they're probably too scared to come forward as well. I, 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 I can't comment on that. So, through all this, Peter, a very interesting life. Good guy, bad guy, good cop, bad cop. You've seen a lot of stuff. People are going to be watching thinking, fuck me, man. It's, um, but you're going to get a lot of support as well for what you do. Obviously, Thank people you. sitting on the other side of the fence, you're, going, you're a fawn on their side, so it's understandable, but for what you're doing and I take my hat off to you for trying to do what you're going to do do you know what I mean and it takes courage especially the shit you've been through as well the trauma the pain a bit of PTSD depression and to still being here I think it, this is what probably keeps you alive if I'm honest this is a bit of excitement that you can't ever give up it's like a boxer try to retire they tend to not retire they probably tend to go an extra 10 year than that they should oh, I'm fighting George Foreman next week <laughs> is, there anything, online, yeah. is there anything you'd like to finish up on Peter he'd, he'd kill me by the way yeah. just make that perfectly yeah, you clear. never know um, no 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 no. I was, I was very average with, with my boxing in fact I had a nickname right in my boxing days and it was horizontal right Horiz short for horizontal mm. not the kind of nickname you want when you're a boxer right on that note and thank you kindly for your for your very kind words many courageous people from the world of crime and criminality have come forward and spoken to me their identities will never be disclosed to any living soul on earth and i can guarantee that because unless you double cross me your identity will forever remain a secret i've been threatened with being banged up in court before now for not declaring people's identity and getting held in contempt of court and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not afraid about, you know, saying no to the police or the judiciary, right? Your secrets, our secrets will remain just that. Kevin Powell will be caught because I'm not going to stop. I'm simply not going to stop. So whilst all the advantages are with him and those who harbour him and fund him, I've only got to get lucky once, you know? That's, that's all I need. But it won't be through luck. It won't be through luck that he's captured. It'll be through bloody hard work. And I've worked extremely hard in the last 18 months. And I shall continue to do that. Because as you know, I love work. Yeah, it's and, clearly. Uh, and, and I'm going to find him. Thank you very much indeed for having me here. Please, everybody, this is not about profit. This is about PAL, right? If you buy this book, and as I say, read the reviews, what it does is it increases the likelihood of my publisher saying, you can write Man Hunt Part 2. And what will that mean? That will mean I get a few quid. And where will that few quid go? On my hunt for Paul. I'll put in there, 
how much money I've, I've, I've earned out of it. And I have not put one carrot on my family's dining room table throughout this hunt for Pile. It's about Pile, not profit. So please, if that encourages my publisher to say, Peter, write part two, that would be fabulous because, you know, it's an expensive business. I've spent weeks and weeks and weeks on the road. So there's all those hotel bills. I've been on planes, trains and automobiles, you know, thousands of miles and all that stuff. So, Peter, it's been a pleasure. I wish you all best for the future. Thank you. Take care. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.